About a year ago, I made a video titled My Nietzschean Feminism, in which I was trying to redefine my feminism. Liberal that I am, I always regarded myself a feminist, someone who believes in gender equality. But since today's Western feminism is obviously opposed to gender equality, I had to ask myself if I still want to define myself as such, or just call myself an egalitarian. I decided to keep calling myself feminist, and I justified it by wanting to keep supporting the feminists in the third world, especially in the region where I live. So I offered a version of feminism that relies on my Nietzschean worldview. Later, I realized that my aversion to calling myself egalitarian is because I am Nietzschean. I do believe in equality before the law, but we already have that in the West, so the debate isn't legal but cultural. Nietzscheanism is not about being equal to others, but about empowerment, about achieving your potential, excelling in what makes you unique. So I want to support the people who are displaying this sort of attitude. For women, that could mean developing their femininity. So, as a culture critic, I want to shine a light on women who express and develop their femininity in cultural ways, and that is what I was doing in that video. Meanwhile, regressive feminists keep on doing their thing, which is to attack the positive aspects of Western culture, and one of their main targets is masculinity, which they are trying to destroy. The logic goes something like this. Masculinity and femininity are social constructs, which the patriarchy created. In their nature, male and female are basically the same, but these constructs teach them to behave in certain ways according to their gender, and creates a class system in which men dominate women. Masculinity demands of men to be emotionally stultified, selfish, domineering, aggressive and possessive. It is a toxic artificial construct, which only makes men miserable, and also drives them to hurt women and make their lives miserable. So we must eliminate both masculinity and femininity, and then we will finally live according to our shared nature and be happy. That's the ideological position, although I think many feminists don't really understand it. Many of them talk as if they believe masculinity is bad but femininity is good, and what they actually aspire to is eliminating only masculinity, and teaching everyone to behave in a feminine way. Anyone who isn't an SJW realizes that men and women are not the same. There are statistical differences between them when you look at different characteristics, and masculinity and femininity are based on those differences. Nobody denies that there's also a culturally constructed element in how we perceive masculinity and femininity, but to think that they are entirely constructed is ridiculous. So the attack on masculinity, the attempt to eliminate it, is harmful, and should be resisted. If it was just the SJWs attacking it, it would not be much of a problem, but there are also a lot of passive aggressives around who are taken for a ride and by the idea that there is something wrong with masculinity. We have come to a point in which masculinity, too, needs to be defended and empowered. But to do that, we should be mindful of what masculinity is and what it stands for, and this video will attempt to shed some light on this question. So first of all, I'll begin with an observation. Masculinity is not an artificial creation, it is based on the reality of human nature. Human nature, of course, is diverse, and every individual is slightly different, but aggression is part of the nature of every human to some extent, and human males are statistically more naturally aggressive than females, especially when it comes to physical aggression. Masculinity is based on male characteristics, but it is not an expression of our nature. On the contrary, it is a code of conduct by which males control their nature, and direct it in positive, rather than harmful, directions. A big part of the masculine code is aimed at protecting women against the aggression of men, whether it is other men or you yourself. Which is why the current attack on masculinity is dangerous to women. Here is a warning to my female viewers. Beware of men who agree with the idea that masculinity should be eliminated. Some men are just not masculine by nature, and that's fine, that's part of human diversity. But a man who is ideologically repressing his masculinity is a man who is not in control of his drives, and therefore dangerous to women. The male's sex drive and violent drive are very powerful forces, and part of being a man is learning how to control these forces. The first step in learning to control them is acknowledging that they are part of you. Those male SJWs who think that sex and violence are a learned thing, and can be eliminated just by learning to think differently, are woefully out of touch with their own nature. Be very wary of such men. Learning how to control our animalistic nature is basically what human civilization is about, and the history of humankind can be seen as a civilizing process. In Europe, around the end of the Middle Ages, the noblemen gradually stopped fighting each other, and instead huddled together in royal courts, and developed a court culture, 
which took the civilizing process to extreme heights. The court culture was based on manners, which were partly about creating a more peaceful society, but in big part it was aimed at separating the aristocrats from the rest of humanity. They created the concept of the gentleman, someone who isn't like the brutish lower classes. By the 18th century, this genteel culture refined its manners to such an extent that it became ridiculously delicate and prissy. But then came the modern state, which aimed to abolish the class differences. In the modern state, all men are considered gentlemen, and the state tries to refine them and teach them the right manners. But the lower classes regarded the aristocratic culture as effeminate, and didn't want to become like that. Masculinity is, in large part, a rejection of the attempt by the elite to force its manners on the masses, and a celebration of male traits. But, again, that does not mean acting like beasts. The modern man does want to become better and to advance in society, and the lower classes are no exception. Our idea of masculinity is undergoing a perpetual process of refinement, in which we move along with the times and adjust our perception of what it means to be a man. This process has enabled the lower classes to become more acceptable and gain better chance of upward mobility, and it has also taken us away from the genteel aristocratic ideal, and established a more masculine ideal of man. This process also played a big part in teaching men to accept the growing independence of women, and want to protect it. And it is still ongoing. But today's SJW feminists are completely oblivious to these nuances, and portray masculinity as an attitude aimed at dominating women. Where does this position come from? I would say that there are two main traditions behind it. First, it is part of the aforementioned upper class contempt of the culture of the lower classes. Being mostly upper class, the feminists are continuing this tradition. But more substantially, it comes from the erosion of Marxist dialectic thought. While the original Marxists were very aware that every concept has a history of a dialectic struggle between opposing forces defining it, today's cultural Marxists regard society as if it has just two forces, a dominant class and a subordinate class, who were always basically as they are today. And so, they are ignorant of the fact that masculinity is actually rebelling against the elites, and portray it as something that was created by the dominant patriarchy. Today's feminists claim to be intersectional and speak for all underprivileged groups, but the ignorance in this case, just like in many other cases, makes them work against the underprivileged. So we need to make a stand for masculinity, and not allow them to turn it into a dirty word. But while doing so, let's remember what it is about. Masculinity, as we pointed out, is partly about controlling your drives and directing them into positive and constructive directions, which means that masculinity should evolve with time and become more refined. I am worried that in defending masculinity, we will not agree to have it changed in any way, even when the change is required. Let's just continue the process of refining masculinity, and disregard what the SJWs have to say. As an example of the process I am talking about, let's take something fairly recent, from American cinema. The myth about Hollywood says that it is this big liberal propaganda machine, promoting only left-wing values. That myth is not entirely true. When it comes to action movies, for instance, many of them come from a right-wing perspective. Most of Hollywood's action movie icons have been right-wingers, who made their fame starring in movies written by right-wing screenwriters and directed by right-wing directors. Conservatives make the best action movies. Why? Because through these movies, they make a stand against what they perceive as the emasculating process enforced on us by liberal culture, and give us models of old-fashioned male heroism. And these movies have had a massive impact on our perception of masculinity, and what it means to be a real man. Let's take a look at one such movie, 1971's Dirty Harry. The story takes place in San Francisco, the hippie capital, which is troubled by a psychopath who kills people for fun. He has to be stopped, but the system is quite impotent against him, because the public hates the police, the media takes the side of the criminal and believes his lies about police brutality, and the authorities are working only by the book. Because of all that, good cops lose faith in the system and drop out, and there's no one to stand up to the murderer. The film is an indictment of what liberal values have done to America, turning it into a haven for criminals and psychos. San Francisco is shown as a place full of decadence, in which people have lost their virtuous core. But there's still one man in town who hasn't forgotten what it means to be a man. Inspector Harry Callahan, a tough, stone-faced policeman, who goes by his own rules, and doesn't hesitate to use his gun to instill justice. Realizing that the system is incompetent, 
Harry goes on a vigilante mission to stop the villain, answering evil ruthlessness with righteous ruthlessness. The odds are against him, but luckily, he happens to be Clint Eastwood, so everything works out in his favor. Good old masculinity saves the day. Let's fast forward some years, and have a look at another action movie. The year is 1988, and the movie is Die Hard. This time the villain is a group of terrorists, maybe, who have taken over a building in Los Angeles. Once again, we meet familiar right-wing tropes. There's a decadent society that is partying away while evil people plot against it. There's the media that is completely unscrupulous and cares only about getting a good story. There's the idiot liberal who thinks the way to handle terrorists is to make deals with them. There's the incompetent police and authorities who work only by the book. There's the good cop who got taken off the streets for making a mistake. And there's the one vigilante hero is a real man, Officer John McLean. Something new we see here is the fact that McLean is separated from his wife, because feminism taught her to put her career above the family. It seems hopeless for McLean, but fortunately he is Bruce Willis, so he single-handedly defeats the terrorists and wins back his wife, who falls back into his arms after this display of manliness. Masculinity saves the day yet again. But on the way there, something happens, something we haven't seen in the previous movie. At one point, a teary-eyed McLean has an emotional outpouring, in which he admits that he had done his wife wrong by not standing by her when she was pursuing a dream. If Dirty Harry would have seen this shameless display of feelings, he would have shot McLean's head clean off, but in the two decades that passed between the two movies, our perception of masculinity evolved a little. We came to realize that you are more of a man if you let your woman realize the potential in dreams, and also that it is okay for a man to cry sometimes. Masculinity survives, but only by adapting to the changing environment. Which reminds us that our perception of masculinity is always interlinked with our perception of femininity. So to defend masculinity, we also need to remind ourselves what femininity is about. Hey guys, I'm in Canada, and while I was barefoot, wearing nothing but an apron in the kitchen baking a pie, I was thinking, you know what? My boyfriend's not a very good feminist ally, <laughs> so... Yeah, that look works better with stilettos, June. But other than that, I'd say you got femininity on lockdown. No, that's not what femininity should be about. Well, every once in a while it can be. But our perception of femininity, just like masculinity, evolves with time. So defending femininity doesn't mean that we send women back to the kitchen, it means that we adjust it to be right with the current culture. And nowadays, it mainly means that we should save it from what the regressive feminists are doing to it. Since we were talking about action movies, I'm going to stay in this domain, to provide examples of what I'm talking about. In the last two decades, chicks in action movies kicked ass. While before that they were mainly the damsel in distress that needed saving, now they became fighters who could fend for themselves. Since women are obviously weaker than men, the female action heroes of those years, like Buffy, Trinity or Mystique, had some supernatural powers. The important thing about those characters wasn't that they were fighters though, it was that they were badass. They had a strong character, matching those of male action heroes, while still retaining the feminine side. That's why they were empowering. At a time when femininity was still quite timid, they presented models of women who were more assertive, a model of femininity that was more suitable for a world in which women had to fight men in the marketplace. After that, we got movies in which it became unrealistic, like Charlie's Angels or Kill Bill, in which we saw regular women single-handedly fighting groups of men and defeating them. It was ridiculous, but it was okay, because these movies were supposed to be over the top. After that, however, we started to see action movies that were supposed to be realistic, but in which women were shown as equal to men in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This was not empowering, this was just stupid. A strong and well-trained woman will defeat an untrained man, but there is no way that someone that looks like Angelina Jolie or Scarlett Johansson can defeat a well-trained male fighter. Instead of providing us with inspiring models of women who find a way to succeed despite their natural disadvantages, these movies took us into a fantasy world, in which there are no natural differences between men and women. And the regressive feminists of today are treating this fantasy as a reality. The moment when it really jumped the shock for me was a 2012 movie called Snow White and the Huntsman, a new version of the famous fairy tale. In the Walt Disney animated classic, Snow White has power in that nature responds to her, and she brings joy and blossoming to wherever she goes. She is not strong enough to fight against the evil queen, but her charm makes all men come to her rescue. 
The huntsman takes mercy on her. The dwarves fight the queen for her. And the prince saves her. In this new version, Snow White still has positive power over nature, but she also has many other inexplicable powers, which render her male companions redundant. Instead of one love interest, here she has two hot men in her life, the prince and the huntsman. But they don't do much, because she is the one who leads the war against the queen. I am willing to suspend my disbelief and accept that Snow White Kirsten Stewart is fairer than evil Queen Charlize Theron, but not that a girl who was locked in a tower all her life is a skilled fighter. The dwarves, meanwhile, are completely minimized, which is unfortunate, given that they're dwarves. It's a movie that showed that Hollywood has reached a point where its idea of a strong woman is of a flawless, goddess-like character, who doesn't need the help of men on anything. In other words, what today's regressive feminists believe. Of course, not all products of today's pop culture are affected by this retardation. The TV series Game of Thrones has many strong female characters, but they are strong in ways that women can be strong. There is admittedly the character of Brienne of Tarth, a woman who beats men in their game, but she is a freak of nature, so I can buy that she is this strong. The other female warriors are no match for men in hand-in-hand -hand combat, and must rely on cunning or use of weapons. And the greatest thing about it is that it all seems realistic. If we go back a few decades, the strong female characters in science fiction shows were seen as something futuristic, not something that we are familiar with in real life. The Game of Thrones female characters feel like women we know from our world. I also watched a few of the behind the scenes videos of the show, and noticed the large number of women in the production team, who are there not to fill some quota, but simply because they are very good at their jobs. In other words, we have reached the point where strong and capable women are an integral part of our society, and there's nothing empowering about seeing them on screen. I'd like to see Hollywood changing direction and giving us models of women who explore their feminine sides. But, of course, the reflex in our culture at the moment is still to demand women who kick ass. Whenever there's a new female action hero, we get enthusiastic articles about how finally, finally there's a strong female figure that girls can look up to. It doesn't matter how many hundreds of such characters we saw in the past two decades. The SJW mind is wired to think that we live in a patriarchy, so they forget about all those past female heroes, and always enthuse that this hero is the one that heralds the change. So we need to resist this trend as well. But let's not act like the SJWs and do it on reflex. I feel like whenever there's a new strong female character, some people in the anti-SJW community oppose it automatically. Sometimes it is worthy of criticism, but sometimes it isn't. For the former case, let's take the Ghostbusters relaunch. Here, it was obvious that the movie makers came from a worldview that believes that there is no difference between men and women, so they took a premise that was built on male dynamics, and just replace the men with women. It was stupid, it justifiably got called out, and predictably it flopped. But when it comes to the announcement that the new Doctor is going to be a female Time Lord, I see no reason for the negative reaction. The Doctor Who series has gone through a dozen Doctors, and every Doctor was a different character and had a different dynamics with his human companions. So it's a logical step to have a female Doctor, perfectly in line with the Doctor Who lore, and I'm actually curious to see the new possibilities it will open up. Let's be smarter with our criticism. That's the main message I wanted to convey in this video. Don't be like SJWs and act in a knee-jerk way. To believe that the attack on masculinity is a new and scary development is to have a one-dimensional view of history, just like SJWs have. The history of masculinity is a complex one, even more complex than what I described here, and as I have shown, it has always been attacked and always had to adjust. The SJW attack on it is more malicious, but it is also a lot dumber, so it shouldn't be hard to defeat. So resist this attack, but put it in perspective. In short, take it like a man.